A natural spring that flows at the southern end of Culps Hill, Spangler's Spring is one of the battlefield's most prominent landmarks and for many years prior to the battle it had provided water to quench the thirst of man and animal alike. Union troops of the 12th Corps occupied this area and constructed earthworks on the knoll north of the spring site. When these troops temporarily left the area on the afternoon of July 2nd, General Green was forced to leave much of it unoccupied as his thin line of troops could not reach the section of works above the spring. Adjacent to the spring was a large meadow, bordered on one end by Rock Creek and at its western edge by the Baltimore Pike and Powers Hill where General Henry Slocum had established a headquarters. From this hill, Union officers and artillerymen could overlook the meadow to Rock Creek, which was effective for Union guns during the daytime but Confederates from General Edward Johnson's division decided to arrive in this area long after nightfall. Brig General George Marilyn Stewart's brigade came upon these abandoned earthworks in the darkness and while Stewart's men were initially unopposed, Confederate units adjacent to his ran into Green's men and fighting broke out. Stewart reformed his nervous men at the freshly captured works and sent the 10th Virginia Infantry forward as skirmishers into the Black Woods where they reached a stone wall bordering a small pasture. Darkness proved to be helpful to the Virginians, but was also a detriment as the officers cold not see any Union positions and had little idea of where they actually were. The regiment was compelled to change front to the rear and perpendicular to the wall, Stewart reported from behind which it repulsed a bayonet charge made by a regiment of the enemy. Threatened with an another charge that may not be as easily stopped, the brigade was ordered back to the works, where it was formed in line of battle, the 1st Maryland Battalion on the right and 10th Virginia on the left, the North Carolina regiments still remaining outside the breastworks. This reconnaissance, as well as the reports of scouts and the statements of prisoners, gave us the assurance that we had gained an admirable position. Stewart's troops repelled another Union probe toward the Spangler's Spring area before 11 p.m., when the firing slowly died away and the night turned strangely quiet. Sensing that more Union opposition may lay in wait if he pursued his attack, General Johnson ordered Stewart and the rest of his command to halt and occupy the ground where they were while he requested reinforcements be sent to renew the attack the next morning. At 4 a.m. when Johnson's men were counterattacked by returning 12th Corps troops, Stewart's soldiers found themselves trapped on the knoll. His right regiments, the 1st and 3rd North Carolina, were pinned down by strong Union rifle fire coming from the summit and Union regiments that slipped into the woods immediately west of his position. Union artillery on the Baltimore Pike blasted the trees around his men, defenseless against this terrible fire. At the height of the fighting, two Union regiments, the 2nd Massachusetts and the 27th Indiana, were ordered to send skirmishers toward the knoll where Stuart's men were locked in. By the time the order was delivered to the commanders of the regiments, it called for a full-scale attack. Incredulous, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Mudge of the 2nd Massachusetts told his officers, Boys, it is murder. But these are our orders. The attack was a disaster. As the two regiments charged into the meadow just south of the spring, they were hit on three sides by musket fire, not only from Stuart but Virginians of Brig General Walker's brigade, who had arrived to support the left of Stewart's line. Both regiments lost heavily, including Colonel Mudge, who was shot dead during the charge. A after seven hours of continuous fighting with no possibility of achieving any success, General Johnson ordered Stewart to pull his men from the positions here and reform with the division after recrossing Rock Creek. For General Marilyn Stewart, the fighting had taken a very toll on his command. His 1st Maryland Battalion had lost 189 soldiers out of 400 present and the two North Carolina regiments. Of his brigade, the 1st and 3rd, had both lost almost half of their numbers during the fighting. My poor boys, the general said as his survivors crawled from the hill, oh, my poor boys. The earthworks were soon reoccupied by Union troops who spent the remainder of the day recovering wounded soldiers and burying the dead of both armies. We have just concluded the most severe battle of the war, Colonel George Cobham, 
111th Pennsylvania Infantry wrote to his brother on July 4th, which has resulted in a complete victory on the Union side. The fighting has lasted two days and been desperate on both sides. All round me as I write, our men are busy burying the dead. The ground is literally covered with them and the blood is standing in pools all round me. It is a sickening sight. Located at the southern end of Culp's Hill, Spangler's Spring is adjacent to one of the few open pasture areas in this part of the battlefield. This natural spring provided a steady supply of clear water to refresh farmer and animal alike for many years prior to the battle. With throats parched after their long trek to Gettysburg, Union soldiers of the 12th Army Corps relished the water of Spangler's Spring as they gathered on the wooded slopes of Culp's Hill on July 2nd. These thirsty troops constructed log and earthen barricades on the hillside before they were marched away to support the crumbling Union left flank at the Peach Orchard. L Later that same night, the Confederates of Brig General Maryland Stewart's brigade occupied those abandoned breastworks and also used the spring to fill their canteens. The Union counterattack early the following morning placed the spring in no man's land. Because it lay in front of the reversed line, the thirsty Southerners could not get back to it without running the risk of being shot by Union infantrymen who lay no more than 50 feet away. The spring site was reoccupied by Union troops late on the morning of July 3rd, finally denying its use to the Southerners. Let Legends sprouted soon after the battle that temporary truces were called between the sides so that men from both armies could fill their cups and canteens from this spring. This legend, no doubt, sprung from the stories told by some of the veterans who visited the battlefield years after the war when tales of cooperation between soldiers of both sides were popular. It is doubtful, when looking back at the historic evidence, that this actually occurred because of the location of the spring and the vicious fighting that raged around it. Yet. The legend of those temporary truces declared at Spangler's Spring is still very strong today. The, the fame of Spangler's Spring and its legend eventually led to damage from so many visitors who trampled its banks and destroyed the stone covers. To preserve the spring, the United States War Department constructed a permanent stone and concrete cover over it in 1895 with a small metal trapdoor to gain access to its waters. A metal dipper was provided for visitors to quench their thirst as the soldiers had done years before. This practice was halted soon after administration of the battlefield was assigned to the National Park Service. Due to the possibility of groundwater contamination, the waters of Spangler's Spring are no longer available for public consumption. In July of 1863, Henry Spangler, his wife Sarah, whom he had married in 1855, and their four children, Calvin, Alice, Anna, and William, lived at the Abraham Spangler farm. A day before the battle began, a Union officer arrived at the home and asked Sarah Spangler to take her family and flee out of fear for their safety. After packing some belongings, Sarah departed with her children to the nearby village of two taverns in a spring wagon, but Henry decided to stay at home in the cellar to try to protect the home from ransacking soldiers. General Slocum's 12th Corps of the Union Army eventually arrived at the property on July 1st, where they constructed earthworks above the spring and remained until the next day. Slocum was then called away temporarily, leaving the earthworks virtually unoccupied due to General George Green's inability to reach the area. Consequently, Confederate Brigadier General George Stewart's brigade arrived on the scene unopposed, but was quickly swept up in a series of attacks and counterattacks until the firing slowly died away into the night. The fighting resumed early the following morning when the 12th TH Corps attacked Stewart's men from the west and rained artillery fire from the Baltimore Pike down on the earthworks, where the Confederates were trapped. At the climax of the battle, the 2nd Massachusetts and the 27th Indiana Regiments were incredulously ordered to charge Stewart's Virginians after a series of miscommunications. The results were devastating. While charging through what is now known as Spangler's Meadow, the Union troops were under blistering musket fire from three sides and suffered heavy losses. Colonel Ario Pardee of the 147th Pennsylvania led a far more successful charge across a nearby field which now bears his name. 1,200 Confederates were reported dead. 500 taken prisoner, and many more were wounded as a result. After seven more hours of brutal fighting, General Edward Allegheny Johnson ordered Stewart to retreat and reform at Rock Creek, which allowed the Union troops to reoccupy the earthworks and proceed with retrieving the wounded and burying the dead. The last troops to march through the Spangler farm were Union soldiers involved in the repulse of Pickett's charge on their way to the angle atop Cemetery Ridge. When Sarah and her family returned, 
They found the property in complete ruin. Soldiers had cleared the home of food and bed clothes. One of the family's best horses and all their cows were stolen. All of the fences had been torn down and the crops severely damaged. Union and Confederate bullets littered the ground. The house itself was partially damaged due to its use as a field hospital where countless men soaked the floorboards and stained the furniture with blood. Their corpses and amputated limbs were buried across the property. Despite all this destruction and bloodshed, a tale of brotherhood and comradeship managed to arise from the property. Reports emerged of truces being called between the opposing forces in order to fill up their canteens and cups. These stories likely originated from veterans reminiscing on their experiences and fit neatly into the post-war lost cause narrative of reconciliation. However, as comfortable as this little story is, it is highly unlikely that this event actually occurred because of the location of the spring and the vicious fighting which occurred around it. Romanticizing this portion of the battle does not change how thousands of men lost their lives and wounded men screamed in agony for their comrades in an attempt to find them, ironically on a farm owned by a war immune family. The sto story of Henry Spangler and every branch of the Spangler family in the Gettysburg area is an intriguing one because it is a story that is common yet still shocking at the same time. Countless civilians had their property and lives destroyed by the war, but the contrast between peaceful farmland and roaring guns, cool flowing springs, and the screams and flowing rivers of blood from the dying remains chilling, nonetheless. Thank you.